Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Strategies for Addressing Vaccine Misinformation in the Practice. My name is Kathleen Amos and I work at the Public Health Foundation. I'm joined by my colleague Russ Rubin and we are pleased to be hosting this webinar on behalf of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. We have several excellent presenters with us for this webinar and are very much looking forward to sharing their presentations with you. As we get started, we would like to go over a few housekeeping items for this webinar. On the slide, you can see an image of the attendee control panel, which you should see on the right side of your computer screen. This control panel is your hub for interacting with the webinar. First, in the control panel, you should see an audio section. We have two options for accessing audio for this webinar, listening through your computer speakers or calling in on a phone. If you are using your computer speakers, please choose the computer audio option. If you are using your phone, please choose the phone call option and enter your audio pin, which can be found in the audio panel. Please make sure to select the audio option you are using, and if you choose to listen over your phone, please also be sure to mute your computer speakers to reduce any echoing. Regardless of which option you choose, all webinar attendees are muted. The slides for today's presentation are available for download in the handout section of your control panel. Links included in the slides are not live during the webinar presentation, but are live in the handout. So if you download a copy of the slides, those links will take you to the additional resources. Throughout the webinar, please submit your questions or comments for the presenters via the questions box in your control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we will address as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you have difficulty with any of the technology for the webinar, please also use the questions box to send us a message and we will help troubleshoot. Uh, and finally, we wanted to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available following the webinar. With the recent outbreaks of measles across the U.S., ensuring parents have access to accurate and credible information about vaccines is key to increasing vaccine acceptance. As a trusted source of information about vaccines, healthcare professionals can play a key role in establishing trust and educating parents and patients on the important role that vaccines play in protecting against serious diseases. During this webinar, practicing healthcare professionals will share their evidence-based strategies for recommending vaccines and addressing vaccine hesitancy in their practice. To share this information, we have with us four speakers. Dr. Nancy Messonnier, Director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, NCIRD, at CDC, will provide opening remarks about the agency's efforts to address vaccine misinformation and the important role that healthcare professionals can play in addressing vaccine misinformation. Since beginning her public health career in 1995 as an epidemic intelligence service officer in the Deputy Director for Infectious Diseases, Dr. Messonnier has held a number of leadership posts across CDC and within NCIRD. Dr. Messonnier has provided critical leadership to CDC's cross-cutting laboratory, global health, and surveillance initiatives. She played a pivotal role in the successful public-private partnership to develop and implement a low-cost vaccine to prevent epidemic meningococcal meningitis in Africa. More than 150 million people in the African meningitis belt have been vaccinated with men Afrovac since 2010 with remarkable impact. Dr. Messonnier also has been a leader in CDC's preparedness and response to anthrax, including during the 2001 intentional anthrax release and in evaluating simplified schedules for use of licensed anthrax vaccine. Dr. Messonnier received her BA from the University of Pennsylvania and MD from the University of Chicago School of Medicine. She completed internal medicine residency training at the University of Pennsylvania. She will then be followed by Hani Sternberg, President and CEO of Refua Health, and Dr. Karina Manny, Manini, sorry, Refua's Chief Medical Officer, who have worked to cultivate trust with parents and patients in their practice to reassure them that vaccines are safe and effective. Refua Health is a federally qualified health center in New York that serves patients in communities affected by ongoing measles outbreaks. Connie Sternberg has been president and CEO of Refua Health in Rockland County, New York since its inception over 25 years ago. She has grown the organization from a small community health center to a multi-site health system and key driver of population health for the region. Dr. Karina Manini is the chief medical officer and chief administrative officer for Refua Health. She leads the Refua Community Health Collaborative Performing Provider System under the New York State Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program and continues her oversight of the clinical activities of the health center. Previously, she was medical director from 2006 to 2015, while concurrently practicing internal medicine as teaching faculty at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And our final speaker today is Dr. Todd Lynn, a practicing pediatrician and the CEO at Kids Plus Pediatrics and the Breastfeeding Center of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
who has been a vocal advocate for the importance of effective communication to address parental hesitancy about vaccines. Dr. Willen has led clinical vaccine research at Kids Plus for 14 years, including 40 plus studies as both sub-investigator and a principal investigator. His areas of focus for the past decade have been immunization communication, primary care and breastfeeding support, patient family engagement in the office and online, and pediatricians as advocates. Dr. Willen has served in a variety of roles as consultant and advisor on vaccine-related projects in his practice, as well as with professional medical organizations, vaccine manufacturers, and other vaccine-related entities. So before we dive into the content of the webinar, we do have one quick poll today to help us get, all get to know a little bit about who is in the audience as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Russ now to take us through that. Thank you very much, Kathleen. All right, everybody, eyes on your computer screens. I have an easy question for you. It'll pop up in just a second. And the question is, what is your main job? Please check out all the responses, make your selection, and hit the submit button. And enter it now, please. All right, just a few more seconds on the responses. All right, I'm going ahead and going to close out the poll and I will share the results with you. And it looks like today we have uh, healthcare professionals making up a large sum of our audience, 68%, followed by health educators and communicators at 14%. Excellent. So we will jump back into the presentation in just a second. And uh, Kathleen, back over to you. Uh, great. Thank you, Russ, and, and thank you all for that feedback. Um, with that, we'd like to turn it over to Dr. Massonier to lead us off. Great. Hello. Today's topic, addressing vaccine myths and misinformation, is incredibly important. And based on the number of you that have registered and are joining us today, you certainly agree. We all know that vaccines are an important and powerful tool to prevent and eliminate many infectious diseases. You may have heard or read news stories that say vaccine coverage is low or decreasing in the United States, but that's just not simply true. Nationwide, we have high vaccination coverage. Most parents are choosing to vaccinate their children. Based on our most recent data, more than 94% of children nationally have received the recommended two doses of MMR vaccine. We also know from surveys we've done that parents' attitudes about childhood vaccines have remained consistently positive on a national level. But that doesn't mean that parents don't have questions. We want every parent to feel confident in the decision to vaccinate and every healthcare professional comfortable answering parents' questions about vaccines. In addition to concerns about vaccines, we know that pockets of unvaccinated people exist across the United States, and the current resurgence of measles is a sober reminder of the consequences that can occur when people do not take advantage of this critical public health tool. We know that in some cases, vaccine hesitancy is due to religious or philosophical reasons, but in a lot of cases, it's related to misinformation. All parents want to make sure their children are healthy and are interested in information to protect them. We want to work with you to ensure that the information they're receiving to make health, health decisions for their children is accurate and credible. The role of the health provider is so vital. What you say really matters. Healthcare providers remain parents' number one trusted source of vaccine information. Research continues to show a patient who receives a strong recommendation from a provider is four to five times more likely to be vaccinated. It's important to remember that parents will have questions and concerns about vaccines, and that's to be expected. The most common questions relate to side effects, vaccine ingredients, and vaccine safety. We recognize that you have time constraints during your visits with patients, and we want to support you as you address vaccine-related questions. CDC has created toolkits and resources to help you navigate the conversation with your parents and patients, and please go to www.cdc.gov forward slash vaccines, forward slash conversations for more information. Your words are powerful, your influence is strong, and you can help us emphasize the solid science behind recommended vaccinations. Today you're going to hear from three great experts as they describe how they have worked with parents to educate and encourage vaccination. Achieving 
Optimal vaccination rates cannot be done with vaccines alone. By working together, we can leverage the complementary strengths of our public health and primary care to make sure we protect our nation's youth. So thank you for all the work that you have done and will continue to do around immunization. And let's get on with the main presentations now. Thank you. Kathleen? Connie, it's your turn. Go ahead, please. There we go. Connie, if you're speaking, I think you might be on mute. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. There you go. Thank Hello, you. everybody. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. I, I'm here to share my experience in navigating vaccine hesitancy before, during, and following an outbreak. Can we switch the screen? I have no conflicts to declare, but I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop of how we got to be here today. On October 1st, 2018, a 14-year-old boy presented to Rafua Health, a large federally qualified health center in Rockland County, with symptoms of fever. Can we go back to the screen? This 14-year-old boy had fever, rash, cough, and coryza. And although most of our providers had never seen a case of meals, there was ample reason to be concerned. This boy had traveled to the United States from Israel. Where an outbreak had recently been reported. The outbreak in Israel was as a result of travel from the Ukraine to Israel. So on that day, when what would later be known as case zero in New York presented, our providers were quick to take action. This case did not present in a vacuum. Most of the physicians at Rafua were faced with day-to-day -day challenges of a growing population who were fearful of vaccines. For over a decade, the population we serve had been targeted with numerous anti-vax activities, including a colored brochure slipped into every mailbox depicting gross misinformation and effectively instilling fear into the hearts of many of our patients. And as an organization, we countered with our educational material. We held health fairs. We hosted many town hall meetings. We offered incentives for up-to-date vaccinations. But much to our chagrin, our vaccination rates continue to drop. In 2009, we experienced a mumps outbreak, also triggered by an overseas traveler, in that case from England. So we were well aware that our community had lost its herd immunity. And despite our best efforts, we we're losing the battle to the vaccine hesitance. Initially, our primary focus was on education and infection control processes. We also identified that there were two cohorts of patients who were vaccine hesitant. Those who were by and large willing to vaccinate but were having difficulty accessing vaccinations and the second cohort those who come what may remained unwilling to vaccinate. And by addressing the first cohort, we were able to administer 3,000 MMRs within the first six weeks of the outbreak. I'm just trying to get the screen. If somebody can please bring the screen back. Page four. Honey, we're on the great efforts to minimize exposure slide. Excellent. 
I need the page before that. Okay, go ahead. And so in order to remove the barriers which existed, we've instituted various innovative programs. Our IT department identified an opportunity where our phone system and our electronic health system were able to be integrated. And this enabled a 24 hour a day phone access for our patients to be able to determine whether or not they or their family members received the full uh, two dose uh, MMR vaccine. We also outreached to our community with robocalls to inform them of an undervaccinated patient in their family. At the same time, working in conjunction with the Department of Health, we instituted various pods and deployed multiple mo mobile units into the community where it would be come into a convenient time or location for parents to be able to vaccinate their children. And as a result, those who were not in opposition to the vaccine, but were simply didn't have an opportunity to do so, were able to access it within the first six weeks of the outbreak. Next screen, please. Can we have the next screen? And here's where we're going to discuss a little bit of the great efforts that were put into place to minimize the exposure. At our main site, we instituted a single point of entry. Checkpoint one, as every patient entered, they were screened for fever. And if they did not pass that screen and or exhibited a rash, they were sent to checkpoint two. Checkpoint two, they were able to ascertain their MMR status. If they did not pass checkpoint one and two, they were then brought to checkpoint three, where they were evaluated as a possible suspect case for measles. So did these elaborate efforts impact positive outcomes? It depends. If the virus we were fighting was the virus of measles, we believe that to some degree we were successful and contained the outbreak. But if the virus we were fighting was vaccine hesitancy, we did not succeed in winning the hearts and minds of those fearful of vaccines. And despite the fact that we had, next screen please. Nearly 300 cases, or as of today, it's actually greater than 300 cases of measles in our county with significant morbidity, with children in ICU, with preterm labor, with most recently a stewardess on the El Al airline passing away from measles. In spite of the high profile, those that were believing in vaccine fear did not change their beliefs. Next screen, please. In May of 2019, a rally was held at the Capitol in Albany, New York. The movement as a movement was angrier and louder, and we've come to believe here to stay. Next screen. As an organization, we've come to realize that the fear of vaccines cannot be overcome with data, with facts, with threats, and even with well-publicized results of not vaccinations. We've come to believe that vaccine hesitancy is based on a very personal deeply emotional belief of individual rights 
versus public health. And so we reached out to the Mayo Clinic, specifically to the director of their population health science program, Dr. Robert Jacobson, and based on his recommendation, we've instituted change. I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Karina Manini, to discuss the changes that we've implemented and the outstanding results that have come as part of the changes. Dr. Manini. Thank you. And I'm not able to take control over these slides either. Um, okay, go ahead, Karina. I'll, I'll um, go back to the start of your presentation. Okay. So uh, um, let me just try it. Yeah, no, it's not working. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll open with a quote. Oops, you went too far. So my quote is a quote from Don Berwick and uh, W. Edwards Deming. These are trailblazers in bringing quality improvement to healthcare. Their quote is, every system, keep going back, Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. If we wanted a different outcome, we knew we needed to change something in our system. And what we didn't know is what, and also how quickly could we do it. So to level set, we brought in Dr. Robert Jacobson. Next slide. Uh, he's, as uh, Hani Sturmer just mentioned, he's a national expert on vaccine hesitancy. And we asked him to educate us on what the available data show about what works and what doesn't to improve vaccination rates. I'll share with you three studies he highlighted that we found particularly eye-opening and which are informing our strategy going forward. Next slide. The first study uh, focused on MMR. Nihan surveyed parents on their vaccine attitudes and practices before and after they were randomized to one of four interventions or control. The interventions were the things that we intuitively think would promote vaccination. The first group received information explaining the scientific evidence that MMR does not cause autism. The second got information about the dangers of the diseases present, prevented by MMR. The third group was shown graphic images of children who have those vaccine preventable diseases. And the fourth group heard a dramatic narrative about an infant who almost died of measles. The study showed that no intervention increased the intent to vaccinate. Among parents with the least favorable attitudes towards vaccines, the corrective information actually decreased their intent to vaccinate. The study found that images and narratives did scare parents, but that fear resulted in increased beliefs in serious vaccine side effects. Next slide. In the second study that Dr. Masonier alluded to uh, in her intro, um, looked at whether a physician recommended the HPV vaccine to young women, and if yes, how strongly on a scale of one to five. The study found that those who received a recommendation were overwhelmingly more likely to be vaccinated. And a strong recommendation, rated a five, led to a fourfold greater likelihood of vaccination than a weak one, rated a one. Next slide. In the last study I wanna share, Opal recorded infant well visits and coded the language used by the provider when initiating the vaccine discussion into two categories, presumptive, where the provider presupposes that the parent would vaccinate, and participatory, where the parent is presented with a decision to make. Examples of the presumptive style are, well, we have to give some shots, or so we'll do three shots in the test. Is this okay? And uh, examples of the participatory style are, what do you want to do about shots? Or are we going to do shots today? The odds of vaccination were 17 and a half fold higher with presumptive language. And when they looked at what happened when the parent initially resisted, but the provider persisted with their original recommendation, nearly half of those parents accepted the original recommendation. These results call into question the patient-centered, autonomous, shared decision-making approach that we've so ardently adopted in healthcare delivery. There's a lot of opinion written about this, but these findings question whether the pendulum swung out a bit too far. Next slide. So to summarize, education and scare tactics alone don't work. They can even backfire. Clinicians' recommendations matter. A stronger recommendation has a greater impact. Presumptive language is much more effective than participatory language. Persistence pays off. Next slide. 
So armed with that information, we set a goal to measurably increase childhood vaccination rates within six months. We used a rapid cycle quality improvement structure, which I'll talk more about in the next slide. And through that, we identified key drivers of low vaccine rates in our system. And we implemented nine high impact action plans, each with their own 30 to 60 day PDSA cycle. PDSA or plan, do, study, act essentially describes the iterative process by which you design an intervention, implement it, measure its impact, adjust the intervention, and then repeat the cycle. Next slide. Rapid cycle improvement is the PDSA process I just described, condensed into periods of three months or less. We based ours on the New York State Department of Health MAX program. If you're interested in more details, you can just Google NYS DOH MAX and you'll find it. But the key elements are as follows. The team includes varied perspectives from frontline to executive decision maker. In our case, it included our CEO. It uses change management techniques such as clear goal setting, establishing a sense of urgency and starting with a quick win. It leverages multiple QI tools like flow charts, driver diagrams, and process mapping. Here you see a photo of our current to ideal state pathway activity. And of course, as with any good quality improvement exercise, there's continuous measurement and reporting. Next slide. So we kicked off the program in January, and these are our results after six months. This graph looks at all vaccines due at infant well visits across our, across our health system uh, in a given week, and it plots what percentage were actually given at that visit. So if a baby was due for four vaccines but only got two, that would be 50%, and we're reporting our entire population in aggregate. That percentage is on the y-axis. The x-axis represents the start date of each week over a six-month period. Our average rate for all of 2018 was 47%. So less than half of indicated vaccines were being given. And as you can see, that rate continued into the first month of our RCI process. And if the outbreak started in October, even the outbreak itself, as Connie Sternberg mentioned, wasn't really moving the dial. We believe it was the interventions that we implemented that really made the impact. Six months later, the best fit line, which hits about the same point as the actual rate, is at 76% and climbing. We've seen similar trend for non-well visits and other age groups under 18 as well. So what were the nine action plans that we implemented to achieve this? Next slide. They really fall into two buckets. The first half focused on the primary care provider. We knew from the research that with proper skills, providers have great potential to increase vaccine acceptance, so we spent a lot of time on training. We shared provider vaccination rates across the departments to open up the dialogue about what is working and demonstrate that it can be done. For a couple of providers having a really hard time, we provided one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching and continue to do so. A third action plan addressed the misconception by providers that one vaccine is better than nothing. Delayed and creative scheduling feeds into misperceptions that some vaccines are optional or less important than others, or that the recommended vaccine schedule is arbitrary, when in fact it is the optimal schedule based on rigorous testing. We also implemented processes so that follow-up is automatic without the onus being on provider or parent to act. Next slide. The second group of our action plans all essentially boil down to the fact that patient engagement on vaccines can and should happen at every touch point across the health system. One root cause that emerged from patient feedback was that patients felt they got varying messages about the urgency to vaccinate depending on which provider they saw, the specialty, the visit type, even the day of the week. So we set the tone, making Rafua's mission to vaccinate clear to employees as well as to patients through a huge marketing campaign. These images below that you see here are examples of some of the posters you would see all over our health centers, quoting the personal reasons that individuals vaccinate. We greatly expanded the use of our EMR's vaccine alert and have involved frontline staff so that from the moment the parent is scheduling the appointment, they're informed by the receptionist. It looks like your child is not up to date on her vaccines. If any vaccines are due or overdue, the provider will give them at this visit. Nurses have been empowered so that a patient at a podiatry visit will hear from a nurse, hey, you're behind on one vaccine. I can draw it up and give it to you while you're waiting for the podiatrist to come in, okay? And finally, our specialty providers, who were previously left out of the discussion, joined in the effort and even sent personal letters home to their patients 
This quote um, came from our pediatric cardiologist. You trust me with your child's heart. Trust my advice to vaccinate fully and on time. Uh, next slide. So final takeaways. Vaccine hesit hesitancy is rooted in fear. Fight it with trust. Healthcare providers hold the power to combat vaccine hesitancy through strong, consistent vaccine recommendations. Every touch point is an opportunity to challenge vaccine hesitancy and disseminate a clear pro-vaccine message. Uh, thank you. That's next slide is the last slide, and you can turn it over to Todd. Todd, when you're ready, go ahead, please. Make sure you take us off mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks very much. And I love the way that that last presentation ended about fighting fear with trust, because that's where this is all at. So my name is Dr. Todd Lynn, and I would like to talk to you about strategies for addressing the vaccine misinformation at the practice level. And I think there's lessons for us all to learn. But um, in order for me to do that, I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. You've heard about a strong, clear, concise recommendation and the importance of relationship based care. And um, one extra piece I always like to add is the importance of strong, robust communication skills so we all can become better communicators. And, um, and uh, that's part of the story you're going to hear. So let's go forward here. There we go. So let me tell you the story through our eyes. We're Kids Plus Pediatrics. We're a pediatric practice in Pittsburgh, about 20 providers, 100 employees. We're independent with oh, three offices. Take it back one slide, sorry. And um, uh, we're all about evidence-based practices, and that includes communications as well. And in every way, we always strive for excellence and in, in quality and the care that we provide. Now, when we talk about Pediatrics, uh, we often believe that pediatrics is viewed somewhat like this, um, but the way that we do pediatrics is more like this. Um, and we, let's see if we have a change here. There we go. Uh, so what do we, what do we mean when we say that? Um, well, let me, let me show you because uh, that pictorial representation um, really represents how we're built, how we think, and how we perform. And we're all about being very impactful with our connection with our families. We are constantly innovating, and um, we're very successful at doing that because we, we view our practice as a living lab. If we can think up something that we think benefits our families and it isn't going to break the bank and the CFO says it's okay to make the expenditure we do, and, and we've been quite successful. Um, in one slide, I would basically tell you that um, the work I do, and I, outside of my practice, I do a lot of work at the um, national level with the American Academy of Pediatrics, that we see a lot of practices um, viewing themselves as doing these things. Either a child comes in for well visit or their shots or their measurements or we need forms or they come in with symptoms and we have to decide do they need an antibiotic or do they have to go to the ER. And when we reduce what we do into this type of um, thinking, I think we really take away the, the real essence of what we can provide. And what it really comes down to, where the power comes from, at least primary care, is this amazing longitudinal relationship. And at pediatrics, that can go over 20 years. Some practices go all the way up to 26 years. Um, and then their siblings. So you can see families for generations. That longitudinal relationship is an amazing representation of trust. People taking literally their most prized thing in their life, which is their child's life, and, and, and bringing it, uh, that child to you for care. So um, we really emphasize how important that is in everything we do. And back to the communication piece, in a slide, I often tell people that they think they're gonna impart all their wisdom in one visit in that room, when in fact, you need to come about it in really a much more comprehensive way. And that's where Kids Plus has really kind of set um, the tone with, with what we call a multimodal communication. So we don't expect that you're gonna tell a family, oftentimes with a child crying or a couple children in the room, everything they're gonna need to know and that they're gonna retain it. 
Um, in fact, if you can oftentimes get them to remember one or two things, um, you're oftentimes doing well. The real key here and where we leverage our communication expertise is citing the first rule of communication, which is know your audience. And in this case, it's really millennials. They're the generation that are having, parent, uh, having children. The, the second key here is really how do you reach them? And Kids Plus, um, in our really latest evolution, starting around 2009, really decided to double down on this notion of strong communication and reaching um, these, these uh, parents where they were. And that was really with um, a variety of social media platforms. So we doubled down, really trying to reach families on a variety of platforms, some of which you see here. And we saw that our reach was able to go from the tens of thousands up into the hundreds of thousands and even beyond. Um, and even though this might sound a little wacky, um, which Kids Plus is sometimes known to be a bit wacky, we, we believe in the message so much on, on communication and impacting and reaching our families that we created an entire production studio on site in our practice. Um, the production studio has the ability not just with video, and not just um, with tech space, but we're even now getting ready to launch um, a podcast. And that's because that's what the data shows. That's where these families live is on social media. And they live there 365 days a year. So um, again, you may see a family once, twice, maybe even four or five times with a young infant, but you may see them not at all. But every day they are in the Twitter sphere or Facebook or blogosphere, or, and they're somewhere digitally. And so that's where we, to go to, we also go to meet our families beyond seeing them in the office. So where this story all comes around to the vaccine um, recommendations goes back to um, almost two years ago in 2017, um, where we decided, hey, the CDC has just listed HPV elimination and the use of the vaccine a top five uh, goal to really emphasize. So we said, you know what, we're pretty good at this. So we created a video called We Prevent Cancer and we launched it, um, you know, on our, on our Facebook page. And it came out with rave reviews. You know, families were like, this is awesome. We had families calling up and making up, making their appointments for the HPV vaccine. It was only a 90 second public service announcement, a PSA, and having all this amazing um, feedback and and really doing exactly what it was designed to do was create some buzz and some excitement about getting the vaccine. Well, that's where the story starts to go a little bit sideways. And um, even though we strongly support being out there in a digital capacity, um, about three weeks later, this post shows up um, and it says, is this some kind of joke? This vaccine kills people. And some of you probably are rolling your eyes knowing that if you post something pro-vaccine that you may get one of these responses. So it took about three weeks. Um, and I'll cut to the chase since we have limited time today. But really at the end of the first like um, six to eight days of the attack, we had a total of over 808 attackers or actually 808 in those first eight days who posted over 10,000 times to our Facebook page. And I will tell you that millennials prize on th authenticity. We hardly ever banned people in the seven years preceding this. We had only banned 35 people, most of whom 33 were selling things on our, on our Facebook site, the other two with an appropriate language. Um, but in this case, 808 were banned for threatening and for bullying and for citing absolute um, nonsense. And that is a, a part of a take home message that you have to have a bit of thick skin because in today's digital world and because of due to the anonymity, you will, if you are out there in a digital capacity, likely receive harassment, bullying and threats. Um, but what we saw was also a real shift to reputation smearing and harm. We've heard from immunization coalitions, public health departments, quaternary healthcare centers about the concern and actually experiences they've had with this. And um, we are actively working to combat that and I'll, I'll review that. But just to let you know, uh, this, this comes with a bit of a toll, right? So we had uh, a real hit to Kids Plus and this is my pictorial am image of some of the damage that was occurring. And it, and it came in the form of, um, fraudulent and false reviews that occurred on Google and occurred on Yelp and Facebook. Um, and to mitigate and to recover 
um, the reputation and the damage that these um, attacks can elicit. Um, we had to spend time and money um, to really do what, what is called reputation management because they know that if they can knock your Google review down from five stars or four stars down to net less than a star or same thing on Yelp or Facebook, that people actually will not choose to come to you because millennials, if you think about a restaurant and you want a good taco that night and you look up a, a, a taco restaurant with a one star review, you're not going to go there. You're going to go to the one down the block for it with four stars. Well, this is part of their strategy and part of what we experienced. And we decided while we weren't the first um, group to be attacked, uh, we knew we wouldn't be the last and we decided to really fight back. Um, just to let you know, the attack um, for our communications director was really managed um, in eight successive 16-hour days. And um, the final fraudulent reviews weren't able to be removed until 344 days later. Um, so we don't want anybody else to go through that kind of experience. And as a result, we created a four-pronged kind of a counter response to this attack. One was to create peer-reviewed research on the attack, um, a social media toolkit, a rapid response social media cavalry, and an awareness campaign. And so first, I'll just tell you a bit about the, um, the research. So we did research, as I said, with the Graduate School of Public Health and had an article printed in the journal uh, Vaccine in March of 2019, doing a deeper dive into the actual attack, the characteristics of the um, attackers and strategies. It, it might really confuse people to see that the attacks come from both the hard right and hard left. So you have people that are considered in the liberty camp, don't tell me what to do with my body or my child's body, um, and from the purity camp, which is there's toxins and, and chemicals in these vaccines. Um, and, and yet they come together around this notion of attacking evidence-based uh, healthcare. So this article really did a deeper dive, broke those two camps into four camps, and attempted to shed some light on some strategies that we might use to really effectively deliver good information. Um, the second, and so um, I, I would say that includes just kind of uh, the check off the box of the research piece. The second thing we did, and we've worked really hard on this, um, as I said, this attack occurred two years ago, but we now have a toolkit that is ready to be released. Um, we've spent a lot of time, we've edited this uh, at least two or three times to keep updating. It's a living document. It has to reflect the changes that occur on the social media platforms. And it is 80 pages, which you might say, well, that's pretty long, but we would say it really goes into the deep dive. But what it also has on the back as single page crisis kind of management sheets, depending on the platform you might be attacked on. So the whole idea is to help people prepare, defend and clean up after these types of attacks. Um, we have a release date of September 23rd, 2019. So that you'll hear more information coming out soon when we release this and it'll be free to everybody to use. Um, so we checked off the social media toolkit. The next step I just wanna show you was kind of a breakdown of the actual attack. And it'll show you in graphic uh, um, imagery here that the attack really started to build in, in, in full flavor over about three or four days. That blue arrow represents when we put a call out for help. I actually happened to be the American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference at that time. And we asked uh, groups such as SOPM, the Section on Administration and, uh, and Practice Management from the AAP. They came to our help. Vince Ionelli came to our help. An amazing group called Physician Moms Group, an international group, 60,000 strong, came to our aid. But we knew that you know not everybody would have the resources to reach all these people. So one of the things we decided to do was to recreate this cavalry, or if you're a bit of a Tolkien geek like I am, we said, uh, create the writers of Rohan, and we'll create a signal fire, uh, uh, the signal fires of Gondor by creating this entity called Shots Heard Around the World. It lives on uh, uh, several places. So Twitter, there's a, a publicly viewable page. But if you want to become a vetted member, it's a private group. They're vetted, they're pro-science, and they are the group that is asked to come to the aid of people that are um, being attacked. So if you email us at join at shotsherd.com, we vet you, um, and then you're given access to a closed Facebook group to see when attacks are occurring and to respond in a supportive way to groups that are actually just trying to promote evidence-based vaccination. And if you see an attack going on, you can notify us by sending an email to alert at shotsherd.com. So what you see here is a combination of resources that we've created. Um, 
with the Twitter group, with the private vetted kind of email group that we let people know about when um, people are being attacked. And there's also a web page that's about to go live at shotsherd.com. Again, um, this is not financed by any outside organizations. This is our private independent pediatric group doing all of this. Um, and the website actually has a go live date now just announced of September 18th. So you'll have more information to see how to help other groups, uh, including uh, if you, you yourselves want help on how to promote um, evidence-based vaccine messaging. Um, and again, it really does come down to good communication expertise, but also really good methodology built on relationship-based care. And so the last piece, so there we are, we, we have the shots heard around the uh, World Rapid Response Group. Um, the last um, target, as I pointed out here, was this awareness campaign. We've been out all over the country, including even internationally, um, talking about the importance of, of these, uh, this distrust and disinformation that's out there. And we, we really uh, have pushed hard. We got into the cover of the LA Times, Washington Post, we even made it onto ZDog MD, really making sure that everybody else was aware of this. And the, and the campaign has taken us literally um, to different con uh, continents, either in person when we presented or um, through social media connections, because this is a global issue. Countries all over the world are also facing this distrust, particularly driven on social media. And um, as you can see here in this next slide, these are just some of the uh, media appearances that we've made to get the word out. So all told, um, we think we've been pretty successful in getting the word out, but we haven't stopped because these attacks are still occurring. Uh, and what we've been told by some of the national uh, players on how to get the attention of these social media platforms to really take their, to be accountable and be responsible is to come up with system level targeted change. So for instance, creating the ability to filter out groups that are anti-vaccine from following and um, and harassing groups. We're not in any way imposing on their First Amendment rights, but we don't have to be attacked um, by them and, and visible to them. The second thing is that when fraudulent reviews appear on Google or on um, other entities like health grades, they need to be accountable and responsible. It took the Guardian and um, the Washington Post and these uh, national uh, media, as well as a national and international measles outbreak, for them to remove those final reviews that were fraudulent 344 days later. We don't think that's okay. And then finally, to leverage digital platform motivations to create change. So we need to kind of work together in order to do this and let people know what the risks are. Finally, um, I would like to point out that uh, don't forget that while face-to-face, evidence-based communication is critical, that people are still immersed in social media, like I said, 365 days a year. And in one slide here, what you can see is, these are the days they're not face-to-face. -face. That's six, 365 days, they are immersed in social media. And so maybe we get an hour of face-to-face -face time, um, but 8,000 plus hours a year, they are being exposed to friends and friends of friends and people they've never met that are giving them information. So one of the things I was most happy about is in my international travels, I was invited by the International Pediatric Association to go to their meeting in Panama. And there I met um, both John Parrish Frawl from Indiana University and Angus Thompson of Santa Fe Pasteur, who um, were teaching an evidence-based methodology called AIMS, which is uh, announced, so it's the presumptive announce, inquire, mirror, and secure. It's the inquire and mirror here that is really built upon the relationship that we have with families. To let them know that we use good active listening skills to understand what their concerns are, to mirror back to them so they feel felt, they understand that we understand how they feel, which also oftentimes can shift that relationship to a point where they're more open to being willing to accept information and fact-based uh, evidence. And finally, if you don't get to vaccination that day, that you can say, hey, look, it looks like we both agree that we're gonna disagree on this particular vaccine, but we both have Susie's best interest at heart, so we'll go ahead and at least give this vaccine and you, you live to vaccinate another day. Um, at, at the end of it though, whether using CASE or AIMS or SHARE, um, again, it doesn't matter on the acronym. It really meant, it, it really is critical that we leverage the relationship and uh, foster the trust to encourage acceptance of vaccines. I've been proud to work with the CDC on how we recommend vaccines in our office. And that's really what this slide here shows. And um, I, I would just like to emphasize again that the time we spend inside the exam room is a fraction 
of the time that we really need to be reaching our families because there's a lot of disinformation every day for them that they're exposed to. And so I like to think of ourselves as uh, pediatric Avengers. So I'm a little bit of a sci-fi uh, cornball, I guess, and uh, a geek, but I don't care who your superhero is that you need to channel. Um, we all need to become better communicators. We need to develop and grow our social media voices, as you see. And I don't think you have to worry about um, just being engaging, but I think entertaining. That, that's part of the storytelling and narrative that's on the anti-vaccine side, but we can be entertaining and engaging on the pro-science side as well. Um, and I really think that we can help one another in this effort. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for those excellent presentations. We now do have um, a bit of time, maybe five minutes or so, for the Q&A. Um, we are receiving quite a number of questions uh, through the questions box. Again, if you have a question, uh, please do con continue to send those questions or comments. We'll take those too uh, for the presenters through the questions box, um, and we will address uh, as many as we can get to here today. Um, so to start us off, we have uh, several questions around working with the community. So um, do any of you have examples or thoughts on um, efforts, how you might engage community leaders or other trusted members of the community um, to really serve as vaccine champions uh, to help amplify that message, or really make the case uh, for immunization? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, this is Todd Willin. Um, I, I would say one of the most important ways that we found to do that is networking, is just constantly going out and trying to meet people who may be in positions that this is a real important issue. We, we did so with a couple of our legislators in the last uh, four or five months, and we were thrilled that they decided at, at the Pennsylvania, uh, two Pennsylvania state legislators came to our practice, Kids Plus Pediatrics, to announce pro vaccine legislation. So I think just by getting out there and, and actively networking, talking to people, introducing yourselves, letting them know how passionate you are on this topic is just, is just critical. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question of, about moving um, upstream and not that we're not already there, but um, ideas, um, if you have any ideas for upstream work during the prenatal period or labor and delivery to help increase the pediatric immunization rates. So um, are you aware of, have you used any effective strategies uh, to begin this messaging uh, with expecting women? Does anyone have any thoughts on that one? I'm happy to talk again here that uh, one thing I think that's very important to know is that it's just in the past two to three, maybe maybe more, but recent that obstetrics has really become a, a home for immunization. I would say prior to the um, best practices of giving a DTAP or a Tdap to moms in their third trimester, obst obstetricians were so-so, I believe, on immunizations, and even though they were supposed to be giving flu, when the Tdap became a, a, a really a critical part of the third trimester care, we see that they were much more aware of cold chain and immunization practices. So I think we have a building ally in the obstetrical world, and, and it's a place that we can, again, forge some more partnerships. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Manini, we have a question for you. You mentioned during your presentation um, providing or emphasizing a lot of training. Uh, can you share any more details regarding the training and coaching um, that you provided to providers on evidence-based vaccination strategies? Sure. Um, so um, Todd talked about also the case method. It's, I, they really all are very similar, but um, that that is basically the same concept at, where you're not only practicing the presumptive style, but also um, really identifying what it is that the decision maker, usually the parent, is wor most worried about. Because sometimes it's, you know, uh, the kid's going to be cranky tomorrow and I have somewhere to be, and you're busy rattling off, um, you know, autism statistics. So I think that really... Um, 
that kind of targeted, th these techniques are what we brought experts in. Um, we did motivational interviewing training, we did a case method, and then we did a lot of um, role playing. And frankly, some ha went, some providers went through more than one training, even of the same training. I mean, you know, these are skill sets. This is not necessarily what we learned in medical school. Um, what we learned was the facts. So, um, so that's that's basically uh, what we did, and I, I look forward to the the toolkit um, that Todd's going to release. I don't know if it has any of that stuff in there, but if anybody, um, if you could just look up uh, the case method or the AIMS method, and um, those are really, I think, uh, the evidence-based methods that I think um, are available for your staff if you want to train them on it. Great, thank you. Um, and honey, you um, talked about for people coming into the clinic, visitors to the clinic, that everyone was screened. Can you tell us a little bit more about that in terms of who uh, actually did the screening? Sure. Um, we had an, almost an army of staff at the front uh, desk, and uh, every person who walked in was actually, they, a temperature was taken. And so if, if they had an elevated temp, they were again put to checkpoint two. And basically there was, uh, they, they were just being looked at if they, if they appeared to have any red, uh, you know, any rash or, or, or runny nose or, or cries or whatever it was. They, if it was somewhat suspicious, they were then sent to, you know, next checkpoint. Perfect. Thank you. We have several questions, you know, along these same veins of how you operationalize and make things, these things happen in um, practice. And um, Todd, we have one uh, similar, again, again, in the similar kind of vein for you, about um, how did your practice find the time, manpower, and financial resources that are needed to engage in all of the activities you mentioned? You talk a lot of, about a lot of stuff. How did, how did you find the ability to make that work? Yeah, I, what I will say is it was something that we made a decision as, a, so we have five owners, we're an independent group, and we decided that's how important communication is. Um, our communication director probably would be the equivalent of, in terms of another employee, a senior RN, but that's how important we believe communication is. And the rest of the equipment in the production studio, again, we footed the bill up for all of that on our own, but again, believe that it's that important in 2019 to reach our families. You aren't gonna reach them in the office in the way that you can when you can reach them where they all live and every one of us lives on our phones or 99.99% .99 of us do. And they're exposed to tons of misinformation. So that's how much we believed in it, that we doubled down and we decided to go ahead and make those expenditures on, on our own. Fantastic, thank you so much for that input. Um, I know we are close to the top of the hour, so we want to be conscious of everyone's time. I also know that there are a ton of questions in the Q&A that we uh, did not get to this afternoon, so I apologize for that. Um, we would like to thank you all once again for joining us for this very informative and very interesting webinar. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we have recorded uh, this webinar, and the archive will be available on the Public Health Foundation's website. Uh, a link to that archive will be emailed to you as, as soon as it is available. Um, and you will also be able to access the archive um, from www.phf.org slash immunization once it is posted. Uh, in addition, from that page, you'll be able to access the slides from today's webinar, uh, as well as the archives of other recent immunization webinars. Uh, we will uh, leave today's webinar open for the next few minutes. Uh, please do continue to share with us any questions uh, or comments that you have through the questions box, or please feel free uh, to reach out uh, to us following the webinar at immunization at phf.org. We'd, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, so thank you all once again, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.